So, uh, traditional rapid prototyping was an additive, uh, sorry, was a reductive process. You would take a blank, then you would trim stuff off. Um, generally, CNC and things, and for those who haven't seen what CNC looks like, I've got a little rubbish video here. Um, so, essentially, that's a drill type head, and it's trimming the metal away slowly, slowly. Uh, you have to use a big blank of metal, uh, so it's very costly and it's very slow. Uh, uh, they're making a set of teeth there. Uh, additive processes uh, in the hobby community started from about 2009, something like uh, Red Rats. Generally using uh, extrusion techniques, basically heat uh, a, a plastic filament and squeeze it out and then it cools into wherever you laid it. And that's what that thing in the back that uh, that <coughs> seems to have been done with uses. Prices vary widely. Uh, you can still get the really high-end stuff, and some of the techniques I'll be talking about in a moment are priced like that. But for the hobbyists, they're actually pretty affordable now. The thing that I would definitely say, though, if you ever want to think about buying them, is what do you want it for? Because as well as buying one yourself, there's now services online where you can send them your design and they'll print it with a proper good quality printer. So, uh, think before buying. So, I'm going to go through the different technologies that are used. The first is 3D printing uh, itself. This basically uses an uh, inkjet head with powder that basically powder gets rolled over and then glue is inkjetted on. And then more powder, then the bed comes down, powder, glue, and so on. And over time it uh, builds uh, something. Generally, uh, a limiting factor here is how granular the, um, the powder is. Uh, you can't get very fine, but it's very, very messy. Stereolithography is one of the highest end if you want plastic, in fact it's the highest end. It uses, uh, onto a liquid bed, uh, it uses ultraviolet light which hardens the plastic. Um, and I have a video of this as well. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do it, either top down or bottom up. But here we see the light shining just, that's laying another layer of liquid and just flattening it, light shining, and we can see the, the image forming below, and then out comes what's been printed out. Uh, there's several different you know, materials you can use here, but generally that's good for plastic, it's good for things that you want to see but not necessarily use. Um, next technique uh, is, oh, is inkjet, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, that is very similar. Next is laser sintering, and this is what you use if you want things out of metal a lot of the time. Uh, it will deploy a small amount of um, powdered material, aluminium for example, something like that, and it will use laser to sinter, which is like it's melting to just about the melting point, where it all sticks together. There's other approaches there that can be done there, including that rolling up powder and then using the laser over the top. Um, very expensive, but very cool. Uh, fused deposition is, is what most people use uh, in the hobby community. Um, who aren't printing, I mean, you can do things like 3D printing food these days as well, but uh, you're not going to be using fused deposition for that. But essentially, as mentioned, filament comes in, gets heated, gets laid out. Um, there's a few different ways that can work. Uh, generally, with the hobbyist models, the 20 by 20 by 20, so they're not large. And that sounds large, potentially, but actually, when the, if you want to buy one of these, look at how large the build area is and think what you're going to be using it for. 20 centimeters really isn't that much, despite what your partner might say. Um, varying arrangements of, uh, actually, no, I'm not going um, X, Y, and Z, uh, so X, Y, and then Z is the vertical generally. Um, some use uh, the print head moves in the X, Y plane, and then as extrusion happens, Z goes down. Others move the bed itself. Uh, I don't like the bed moving ones in general because there's a lot of inertia there, so there's a lot more jitter and they can't move as fast. Uh, speed and quality are very variable. And a key thing to point out with all these is they're a nightmare to actually use. So only use them if you really want to. Uh, if, you know, if, if, you, if you're a geek, like me. Um, because you do end up having to tweak, tweak a lot of things and manually level the bed and things like that. So the rep rack is one of the best known, and there's uh, several different versions, but here we can see, for example, one where the head moves in the X plane, and Z, as it prints up, this actually goes up. And this 
goes in and out, if I remember right. It might be that way. Oh, no, I think it's that way, in the Y plane. Uh, Autimaker, which is what I've got, uh, print uh, in the XY and the bed in the Z. Um, a lot faster than most uh, when you can get it working. Use it all the time. Uh, comes in a flat pack, a wooden pack, uh, a little laser etch, which is pretty cool. Uh, and here we see the print head itself. So uh, some gubbins here. And this is basically just the heater, uh, and it comes out there. And then we have a fan attached that cools the plastic when it's uh, seated, uh, so it stops some problems. Um, quick look at that. So these are things I printed, a little companion cube. This robot, actually, the photo isn't at a slant, it printed at a slant. The, the reason why, and this is what I mean about fiddly little things, um, one of the dry belts I hadn't fully tightened. So every time it went this way and stopped suddenly, it slipped. And it, had, it was in a certain set of pans, so it just slipped a little bit more for every single, every time it incremented Z. So, yeah, weird problems you encounter, but um, this is uh, just a video of what one looks like. You see it moving back quite well. It's actually remarkable that at hobbyist prices you can get things as accurate enough to print uh, sub millimeter accuracy. <coughs> so uh, and again, I can start off the printer later again and people can see what that looks like. Uh, examples of problems. Well, one problem with this sort of extrusion technique is you can only extrude as long as there's something to extrude onto. Now, for that robot, it's got hands. You couldn't print those hands naturally unless you build a little support out. And that's, you then, if you, if you wanted it to, you have to go and clean those up manually afterwards. This is a sort of worst case scenario for a print. Uh, we're seeing bubbling, which happens uh, sometimes if there's water in the plastic. Uh, seeing a raft, which basically means the layer wasn't set up properly, and rafts are generally not necessary. Stringing often means that the print head is, uh, is either extruding too fast, because maybe the filament's a little bit thicker than expected, um, or that it's too hot. Uh, and the visible layers often mean that the print head is too cold. So uh, it's, yeah, it's a boy, but it's a fantastically fun one. Uh, and I've, I've used it for a few things. Uh, you saw the gun that the guy was using on the Virtuix Omni in the last talk. I bought one of those, but it didn't come with um, a, a stock, so I printed one. Yeah, the, the vents like you would have uh, over a radiator. Didn't need to deal with heat, but uh, much heat, but I had some cables and I had a network switch, so I wanted some air for Couldn't find anything right dimensions, so I printed one. Uh, so yeah, it, it is pretty cool if you're willing to put up with it. The design process is pretty simple. And it's actually this bit that I generally get stuck at, because I have no artistic talent whatsoever. Um, so essentially, design a 3D model using whatever software you want. I use a thing called OpenSCAD, uh, which uh, allows it, which is uh, procedural. So you actually draw the, di draw the model using a programming language. You know, say cube here, delete a cube, uh, a sphere from there, and so on and so forth. It's quite nice. You pre-process it, uh, or pre-press it, so that's setting it to the right size, and so on and so forth. You then slice it, which basically means the software is taking the slices out. It's working out in each plane what it looks like. Uh, something then turns it into uh, the sort of machine code the printer can handle, and then it gets sent to the printer. Just so what some of these look like. This is a I can't remember the format, but this is what a companion cube looks like. And you're talking about faces and vertexes and so on. Obviously, you wouldn't have written this. Um, you load it into a software called Cure for the Ultimaker. So there's a cube. Don't play with any of these unless you know what you're doing. Uh, but you can tweak things like, for example, uh, how thick the walls should be. And different plastics will, will want slightly different uh, settings. This now converts into G code. So we're hit seeing here all sorts of commands that it sends. It's just an ASCII uh, protocol. Uh, so for example, here, it's saying uh, movement. Move the X by this, Y, Z, uh, down. Can't remember what F stands for, and E, extrude, 4.66 amount of stuff. Uh, so that's auto-generated, and then you just print. Now, that's the hobbyist end. And the hobbyist end itself is getting better and better. Uh, but at the higher end, it's insane. So this is the Super Draco rocket on the SpaceX, um, uh, their, what will be their crude um, capsule for 
give it to the ISS, the one that they have crew in. That's 3D printed. Uh, the I talk more, more, more accurately, this bit that's glowing and, and here, the reaction chamber, that's been 3D printed. And so that'll be, they, they've also got some 3D printed stuff in space already. Uh, houses, so this is in China and there's other companies working on this. Uh, so this is a house that looks like an office that has been 3D printed. Uh, it shows you the printer in the moment. I think they did something like 10 houses in one day by, and it's not small, that's, a, that's extrusion. The difference is it's extruding concrete this time. And it's messed up, but very cool. <laughs> um, uh, so that's the future. Food uh, is already happening. Um, there's been some talk, you know, like we're talking 15 years down the line, probably, uh, of where you will have things like this at home, and you won't go to the hardware store to order bolts and things like that, you'll just print them. The, diff the difficulty is, having the selection of materials necessary. But you know, there's no reason why the hardware store itself can't have rapid prototyping to produce a lot of things. At the moment, it's, it's still more expensive. So for example, uh, um, uh, there's nothing stopping you printing your know, little plastic toy soldiers that some of us will have played with as kids. Right? Problem is, 3D printing them takes probably about 20 minutes to print uh, and costs about 30 to 50p each. You can buy a bag of them for 99p. Well, you used to be able to, I don't know about now. Um, um, so the, the, pro, the economy isn't there yet. And so this is another technology that it is very much in the future. But because it's in the hands of hobbyists now, that can really drive movement rate forward a lot more quickly than relying on companies that have to make a profit every quarter. And that's that. That's my talk. Uh, any questions on 3D printing?